Konnichiwa. I am honored by this invitation to speak, and I am also very happy <laughs> to return to Japan after 60 years, that six zero, as I spent some very important time in my childhood in Nihon. Now, I stress that what follows um, is not a review of SAA's past, um, but rather my personal opinion, uh, uh, rather than those of the Society for American Archaeology, of which I'm currently president. Of course, I will be happy to carry any statements to the board of SAA um, for their consideration uh, for endorsement. And my uh, reflections are really on the future rather than the past. And they're influenced by two factors. Archaeology's long-term historical perspective on the volatility of complex societies such as ours, and my own recent experiences in cross-disciplinary communication. I will begin, though, with a story that might distill the direction of my remarks in the late 1980s, with Perestroika and Glasnost in the air, the American Anthropological Association invited Soviet anthropologists to a joint session in uh, USA on anthropology in the new era. By the time the November 1989 meetings took place, disruptions in what is now Russia were so severe that only one Russian scholar could attend. This was Russian social scientist Viktor Schneerman, who said the following, loosely paraphrased. It was a fascinating time for him as a student of the collapse of economic structures and social institutions, as well as loss of faith in an ideology. But he had little time to study what he was witnessing because he was standing in line all day for bread. Now, we archaeologists know that abrupt transitions in societies such as ours are rather common compared to, say, hunter-gatherer societies. As scientists and citizens, we see global climate change is conspiring with human short-sightedness and greed to create grave problems for the planet. People in the Arctic, in dry regions, on Pacific islands, and in low-lying places all over the world already face threats to their ways of life. It's only a matter of time before climate change affects the functioning of larger-scale societies. In my darker moments, I personally wonder whether the worst-case uh, scenario for climate change might be preferable to the continued depredations of supply chain capitalism on the planet. But in any case, we can anticipate radical changes in economy and society over the next 50 to 100 years. So what can archaeologists who presently have the luxury of not standing in line for bread do to enhance general knowledge of the human past, even as events unfold? I will not promote, uh, propose another set of excellent goals that overlap with those of WAC or other institutions such as um, EAA. Instead, I suggest that we consider how archaeological actions proposed in those initiatives could unfold in two possible contexts. The one is uh, perhaps the best case scenario that we can imagine with about 3% CO2 increment, continued extreme climate events, inundation of coastlines, wildfires, desertification, climate force conflicts and migrations, all of which are already underway. I'm just a bundle of joy today, aren't I? I imagine that we will increasingly have to avoid petrochemical costly activities, such as the face-to-face -face conferences and workshops to which we are accustomed. I hesitate to consider my carbon footprint right now. We must consider how to work as well within economies that are increasingly compelled to allocate resources to cope with impacts of climate disruption on other social sectors than academia. But all this is workable. Uh, we just have to figure a plan. The second context represents the worst case scenario, which I guess would be akin to the impacts of all-out war and its intensity globally for our species. 
where our main goal is probably preserving 200 years of knowledge about the human past, as well as something of our craft methods. I have no recipes for either the latter or the former, but I believe we have an ethical obligation to consider, discuss, and plan for such contingencies. Regarding these options, there are some rays of hope, and uh, at least things to think about seriously. Uh, there are some short-term tactics already underway that demonstrate the relevance of archaeological methods and finding in a, in, a, in a time of crisis, which are very much in evidence at these meetings. I'm running from do room to room trying to expose myself to all the different um, uh, themes in this area. Moreover, I suggest uh, that our professional organizations can and should develop just a few long-term collaborative strategies for integrating and preserving archaeological knowledge of human history at several multiple levels, loci, and forms. Two examples of tactics show how archaeology and climate change concerns intersect at community and global levels. The first, which will be discussed here, I believe, is the Scottish Coastal Archaeology and Problem of Erosion, or SCAPE project, where archaeologists have reached beyond traditional heritage management to empower local townsfolk to document, excavate, and conserve uh, coastal archaeological sites. Lacking staff to cover Scotland's huge coastline, much the same situation as Japan's, they started the Shoreward Sure Watch project, sorry, with a mobile phone-based app for local people to document storm impacts on known sites and to register newly exposed sites. I know that similar initiatives are underway elsewhere um, in Europe and including um, also in USA in my home state of California, uh, sponsored by the Society for California Archaeology. They have trained non-archaeologists in excavation and high-tech equipment technique to document the sites that are about to be destroyed. The key here is archaeologist empowerment of local communities as not only the first responders in archaeological conservation, but also true knowledge producers. This erodes the status of the expert while conserving and growing a shared expertise. At the global level, archaeologists are sharing records of historical ecology of marine and terrestrial species of animals and plants with fisheries and wildlife managers, what so archaeologists Tom McGovern and others refer to as distributed observational networks on the past, part of theme 13 here at WAC. To give one example, zoologists are incorporating 20 millennia of archaeological evidence on European brown bear history, archaeological traces of human land use, and climate change records for that period to develop conservation plans for bears. In these examples, communication is crucial. Archaeologists have valuable information to share with colleagues in other disciplines if we can learn to listen and talk across traditional disciplinary boundaries. This is not easy. But this is a moment when many scholars in many fields realize that the crisis upon us requires us to erase the divides between the hard sciences, social sciences, and humanities. And some are seeing archaeology and historical geography as bridges among these fields. We must also communicate with communities, not just in far-flung study sites we visited, but in our own media-muddled, media-saturated societies. All of this is difficult, but given the stakes, sorting out mutual understandings, and searching for a space for constructive conversation among researchers and communities with which we are linked is crucial. Training students in new ways of listening and conversing beyond traditional academic models is already happening, Themes three and nine address these topics. I am a contributor um, in a parallel development, um, the Manual for Decolonization of the Arctic, an experiment that explores such methods and consequential storytelling. 
There, a prominent STS scholar writes about Quaker, Quaker meeting silences and listenings, asking how these may be relevant to moving beyond our traditional modes of discourse in academia. I myself wrote a reflection on the space emerging in some repatriation negotiations where people of divergent histories and different worldviews can work respectively, respectfully toward a common goal. In such engagements, we learn to become different people, different people than we were trained to be. Looking to the future, perhaps we should ask what kind of listening and speaking, as well as expertise, are needed for our next generations of archaeologists. As for overall strategies for preserving the last 200 years of archaeological knowledge amidst radical changes in the very urban middle class nation states that allowed archaeology to emerge, what general themes and plans can we agree upon that can be locally implemented in different ways by diverse coalitions? I return to the notion raised earlier, dare we devise ways to transfer expertise that erase our social roles as experts. With our knowledge of our species' long-term history and its ability to weather very severe environmental changes, as many of us know, we should have the courage to work with others to preserve the part of human, the human story that archaeology has produced and to imagine new ways of weaving that knowledge into human life. Thank you.